Um, where's the S&P 500? Ah. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Here's the S&P 500 data. Okay, so here's the history of the S&P 500. It looks very similar to the, to the Dow. And now, except we have longer history, back to 1871. So I just want to point out one more thing in the S&P 500. So this is an average of 500 stocks, not just 30. But it's more or less the same. But let's look at the same thing, taking the logarithm and check for uh, inflation. Okay, so you see here that, that you know, there are these four cycles. Things seem low in 1871, they go up and they go down. Then you've got another up and a down. And then you've got another up and a down. And you've got another up and a down. Four times the same thing has happened. Now, this could be just meaningless accidents, but it will turn out that um, the demography of the country, the baby boom cycle, we, we haven't had just one baby boom, we've had four of them. So this cycle of stock prices happens to, you know, which is there each time a generation long, happens to correspond exactly to the rise, the, the different age distribution in the population. So another theory of the stock market, which wouldn't have been entertained by these uh, original uh, financial theorists, is that demography has something to do with the stock market. Not information about profits and returns, but the distribution of ages in the population. So I'm not saying this theory is correct, although I was one of the proponents of it. But it, it, leaves, it shows that there's room, I think, in economics, uh, in finance, for economic things, for demography to matter, for leverage to matter, and not just for expectations about future profits. So let's, let me show you another picture. So this is a second way in which Schiller became famous. He said, well, look at housing prices, the Case-Schiller Housing Index. So he's also famous because he had the idea of collecting housing prices. So you know, it's quite amazing. Every town has to record, you know, it's, it, by law, you have to record in the town directory, and they're often on the internet, what the price is of every sale of every house. So everybody has it. It's all publicly available on the internet. And, or most of it is publicly available on the internet. And nobody thought to gather all this information together and take the average and write down an index, okay, until Schiller did it. So here's the Schiller index, um, which is, so, all right. So you can see that housing prices were pretty stable, you know, throughout the 80s. And then in around 2000, they started taking off. So this is when the stock market was taking off, too. So Schiller says this is irrational exuberance. People just went crazy. They somehow think things can never go down, and they're just going to keep going up, and they keep buying because they think things are going to go up. And it's uh, crazy, and things are going to, you know, psychology, eventually people are going to, a new narrative is going to start. Somebody's going to say, oh, they've been going up so long, they can't continue to go up. Things have to go down. Okay, and things went down. Now, I think there's something to psychology. So there was something missing in the original finance story. Uh, the finance guys, by the way, they would say, well, the rise is not so surprising. Look at the mortgage rates. This is the interest rate you have to pay if you get a mortgage. There's been an incredible decline in mortgage rates over the years. So it's easier, it's less costly to buy uh, housing. If you take the present value of your expenditures on buying the, you know, you just have to pay less. So that's why, the, 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 you know, uh, you, you know, that you pay over a long period of time, and so the interest rate is less, and so the, the, the value of the houses is worth more, because you're discounting the future benefits at a lower rate. You'll hear all about discounting later. So there's no mystery. On the other hand, they don't have any, nothing happened to interest rates. They kept getting lower, lower. So there's no reason why the market should have crashed. So again, this seems like an indication for Schiller. Now, it also, in a way, is a vindication for, for my theory, which is non-psychological. So I, I, I'm distrustful a little bit of psychology because it can be anything although I agree it's important so my theory is it's when you when you take a loan you have to negotiate two things the interest rate and how much collateral you put up who's going to trust you to pay back when you buy a house they say you can't just borrow the whole value of the house they say well make a down payment of 20 percent borrow 80 percent of the value of the house okay and so what I say is that instead of paying all your attention to the interest rate Think about the collateral rate. Why is it 20% that you have to put down? Maybe it should be 10% or 40%. Well, in fact, that number changes all the time. 
So here what I've done is the, the pink line from 2000 to the future, that pink line is Schiller's housing index inverted. So you notice the scale on the right is the housing prices, but I've inverted it. Okay, and on the left, I have the down payment percentage. So it starts at 14, these are not, not for, these are non-agency loans. So I'm not going to explain, we'll come back to the graph later. I don't have time to explain exactly how I got it. But anyway, what you see is that from 2000 onwards, the down payment people were asked to make to buy their house got lower and lower and lower and lower, and it got down to 3%. You could put down 3% of the value of the house and borrow the other 97% of the value of the house to buy it. So amazingly, the prices go down just with what's called the leverage. So why is it called leverage? Because the amount of the cash you put down payment, say 10%, you can lever it up and own an asset that's worth 100, even though you put down $10. So you're leveraged 10 to 1. If you put down $3, you can leverage it and, and you can get a $100 house, you've leveraged it 30 to 1 or 33 to 1. So that's why it's called leverage. So anyway, the point is that leverage went way up. The margins kept going down and down and down. And just at the, the peak of the housing cycle, which is the bottom of that curve, that's when collateral started getting tougher. And people started asking for more money down again. And sure enough, the prices turned around. So if you look at the prices of mortgages, again, the inverse on the right, and you look at the the margins on the left, not for buying houses, but for buying securities, and I don't have time to explain this whole graph, but the blue line is the buying securities. So 98 is a big crisis, the margins spike up. I don't have pricing data back till then, that's the blue line. And now from 2007 to 2009, you see the margins spiking up. So to buy a toxic mortgage security, you, you, people who, investors don't pay cash, they borrow part of the money to buy it. They used to put down only 5% to buy it, now they have to put down 70% to buy it on average. Well, what happened to prices? Prices, this is the inverse of prices, in 2007, they started to collapse. Okay, so this going up means prices are collapsing. So once again, the margins, tougher margins means lower prices. And as the margins came down recently, the prices have gone up recently. So it's an alternative theory. So, um, all right, so what, what, uh, all right, so what, what else do I want to show you? So it doesn't mean that the standard financial theory is wrong. After all, I helped run a hedge fund. Six of us founded it, and we've been in business for 15 years. We must believe in standard financial theory because that's how we've been making a lot of our money. I mean, we exploit all those algorithms, and those are the things I'm going to teach you. So I certainly believe it, and it's very important. Uh, uh, to teach you that again today, but there's more this, this semester, but there's more to the theory um, than just that. So let me show you the Dow, I want to show you one more thing in the, in the Dow Jones or the S&P, which I forgot to mention. And where is this? Oh, I can't get it out of that. Let's try Dow. Okay, so Dow. Okay, where was the, where was the peak of the Dow? It was right over here. Now, what was the date? The date's supposed to flash here. Okay, so it's October 1st, 2007. Okay, now, let's just, so that's when people started to realize something was wrong with the world and things headed down. Okay, now why, but if you look at, and until then, nothing bad seemed to be happening in the world. But suppose that you looked not at um, the Dow, suppose you looked, sorry, Okay, here's a graph. Suppose you look, suppose you looked at the subprime mortgage index. So you see it's 100. You'll understand what these things are. So 100 means nobody thinks there's going to be a default. Over here, January 2007, that's 10 months before the stock market starts to go down, before it hits its peak. The stock market's still going up here. A month later, this is April 2007, a month later, the subprime index starts to collapse. You see it goes from 100 to 60. We're already in, in, in February or March 2007. So that means the people, those experts trading mortgages, already realized there was a calamity about to happen. This was long before anyone else perceived anything happening, long before the stock market moved, long before the government did anything to correct the problem. 
So just as financial theory says, if you pay attention to the prices, you can learn a lot about the world. The people trading those things, their life depends on fixing the right prices. Probably they know stuff that you don't know. The prices are going to reflect their opinion. If the price collapsed, part of the reason it collapsed, maybe margins and something had something to do with it, but part of the reason it collapsed was because they knew something bad was happening. So for two and a half years, we've known there's going to be a major catastrophe in the mortgage market. And it'll go from 100 to 60, and since to 20, is a total calamity. So you know that there's, uh, there, there's 1.7 million people who've already been thrown out of their houses. Another 3.5 million aren't paying their debts and uh, you know, are seriously delinquent. Probably all of them will be thrown out of their houses. And another 4 or 5 million after them might default and have to be thrown out of their houses. So it's a major catastrophe. And the market told us and warned us about it two and a half years ago. And nobody's been done anything about it, basically, until now, as we'll find out. So it's not that I think financial theory, the standard financial theory, is wrong. I think it's incredibly useful. I just think it has to be supplemented by a more general and richer theory. So. Um, by the way, just to, maybe I should show you how my hedge fund has done, just so that you don't, th <laughs> you don't think that it was a total failure. Um, so, <laughs> uh, oh dear, where is my returns? Here we go, EMG returns. It's sort of interesting. So we started in 19, so the, the Kidder Peabody went out of business in 1994. There was a tremendous crash in the market, a low of the leverage cycle. The purple is Ellington, that's the hedge fund. Uh, you'll see that these are other investment opportunities. The S&P 500 is the green thing, which looked like it was doing great for a while. Um, emerging markets is the blue one, and high yield is the green one. And then there are a bunch of other things, like treasuries, and this is LIBOR, and which is the, what banks lend to each other at. So this says if you put your money into any of those strategies, you know, in LIBOR, keep buying, the, you know, lending your money each month to a, a bank and seeing what interest you get and seeing how much money you accumulate, or putting your money in Ellington and looking at the purple, or putting your dollar into the stock market and see what happens, the S&P 500, this is what happens. So you see there was a crash here, you know, you're fired, you're fired. So we start Ellington. And you know, Ellington does great. And so we have all these years where we're doing great. Then 98, there's another crash. Look what happened. Overnight, practically, we lost a huge amount of money. We almost went out of business. Long-term capital, which by the way was run partly by two Nobel Prize winners, Merton Miller, not Merton Miller, uh, Myron Scholes and uh, Robert Merton, two of the guys I mentioned who were the leaders of the financial crisis, they bankrupted their company. And they went out of business. And why did they go out of business? Because they weren't aware of the leverage cycle, in my view. Anyway, so the, pr so the prices collapsed. Then, look at all these returns shoot up again. And uh, you know, the world seems to be doing great. The stock market, everybody's doing great. Then there's another crisis in 2007. Everything plummets, OK, all together this time. And then everything's going up again. So you know, it's hard to see this and to live through that. So I remember in 98, for example, when there was a margin call, our lenders called and said, we want more money. We don't believe that the assets are worth as much as they were, and so the collateral is not covering the loan anymore. And we said, you can't make a margin call. It's not legal. You promised not to change the margins on us for six months. You can't make a margin call. And they say, well, blah, blah, blah. We don't really know about that. We're making a margin call. So we called up Warren Buffett, and we said, this is terrible. They're making a margin call. They can't do this. We have great bonds. There's nothing wrong with the bonds. They're just, you know, they're going to force us to sell all the bonds to, to pay them the money. And we, how can they force us to do that? They shouldn't force us to do it. I mean, we've got great bonds. It's a great business. It's a great company. And they're going to run us out of business. You can't let this happen. Warren Buffett, why don't you buy part of the company and save us and you'll get rich and it'll be great? He says, say that again. And we said, well, the bond, <laughs> they're going to force us to sell all the bonds on you know, on Tuesday to, you know, to meet their margin call and we'll get terrible prices for the bonds and we'll be driven out of business even though they're great bonds just because they're making a margin call. You can't let this happen to us. Buy part of the business and save us and you'll get rich. You'll own part of a great company. And he said, hell, it sounds like I should just show up on Tuesday and buy the bonds. So, that, so, so we survived the, we survived the, I'll tell you more about what we did. We survived that, no thanks to Warren Buffett. And then, and, Although he had a pretty good idea. And then we, uh, 
then we uh, survived the last crash. So we survived all these crashes. But the fact is, things go up, they crash, they go up, they crash, they go up. Could it all be my fault? I decided it can't be all my fault. It's got to be there's something more basic at work. And that's why I'm going to tell you about the leverage cycle. Now, of course, I realize that you know my pet theories may not turn out to be right, although I think more and more people are starting to think there's something to it. So I'm not going to spend you know, a huge portion of the course just talking about my pet theories. I mean, I recognize that um,